All right, we're going to get started. I know there's some people still filtering into the room, but out of respect for those of you who are here ready and on time, we'll get going. My name is David Feeks. I'm the owner and founder of the Parents Estate Planning Law Firm in Acton, and I want to welcome you uh, to today's webinar, Protecting Yourself, Protecting Your Loved Ones. I want to teach you how to create a rock solid legal plan that helps you to protect not only you, but your family as well. Uh, but even before I begin, I want to take a moment to acknowledge you and really for you all to acknowledge yourselves uh, for being here today. I know that you have to set aside time and I know how hard that can be sometimes. Uh, and I recognize that showing up to think about what happens to your kids, to your family, if you're no longer there is not always a happy topic uh, to be thinking about. Um, so congratulations for showing up for yourself and for your families. In exchange, I want to spend our time together sharing with you much of what I've learned over the years about how to create a rock solid legal plan, again, not only for yourself, but for your families so that things will be as easy as possible for them and for you in a moment of uh, emergency or crisis. As I said, I'm the owner of the Parents Estate Planning Law Firm. We are focused on estate planning day in and day out. Um, and a lot of what we put into the plans for our families is what I've learned for myself over the years, uh, protecting my own kids, first when they were young, now that they're adults. Uh, so for and most of you on the call, whether you've got young kids, whether you've got adult kids, I have either been where you are, I am where you are, or I'm about to be where you are. Um, but I understand all of those, all of those time frames. And what I recognized both when my kids were young and when they uh, became older was that there are always gaps in traditional estate planning. Um, and I've built my firm around figuring out where those gaps are, filling those gaps, so that number one, I knew for my family that my kids were protected no matter what. My wife was protected no matter what. Um, and then everything I built out for my own family, I built out for every one of our clients as well. And it's really one of the reasons that we're out doing educational webinars and soon back to be in-person workshops so that I can share everything I've learned. And that's what I'm gonna do. So you, you should have a pen and a piece of paper handy because you're gonna wanna take notes. For the next 45 minutes, I'm gonna give you as much as I possibly can uh, about the things you need to know, the things you need to be thinking about as you create uh, an estate plan or a legal plan for your family. And I want you to stick with me all the way to the end at the end, I'll, I've got some extra resources for you, and I'm going to show you a pathway for getting this done if you have not yet got this done. So stick with me. Before we dig in, I just want to do a little housekeeping. Number one, uh, I'm going to try to keep this to 45 minutes because uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time. But as I said, I've got lots to share with you, and I don't want to leave anything important out. If you have any questions, you can drop those into the chat. Um, and if you would do me a favor, if you've got a question and you're dropping it into the chat and we'll cover all of the questions at the end, I'll save time at the end for that. Just put a Q in front of it, Q period, and then type in your question. That makes it easier for us to go back at the end and see anything that's a question versus a comment. But feel free to leave comments as well, because um, sometimes that's helpful to other people that are uh, on the call. And uh, finally, everything that I'm sharing with you today is educational only. Um, this is not legal advice. We do not have a, a, an attorney-client relationship. This webinar is not creating any type, kind of attorney-client relationship. Uh, strictly educational for your informa informational purposes only. And any references I make to laws are the laws of Massachusetts. That's where our office is located. That's where our attorneys are admitted and that's where we practice. So uh, my goal for you today is for you to walk away with a better idea of what it takes to create a rock solid plan for your family and not only knowing what it, what it takes, but and having a plan for getting it started 
right now. So let's dig in. I wanna share with you what I would call four elements or four legs of the estate planning chair. And there's four of them. Number one, if you've got young kids, the first element is planning for your kids. What happens if you're not there to raise your minor children until they become adults? Number two is a plan for your money or your assets. All of the resources that you have accumulated in your lifetime that you have right now, a plan for what happens to those resources if something happens to you. Number three, a plan for incapacity. If you get sick, you're unconscious in a hospital and you need someone to step in and make decisions for you, what does that plan, what does a good plan look like? We'll talk about that. And then finally, something that's a little bit different um, that not a lot of people think about, and that is a plan for your legacy. What are those things <clears throat> beyond traditional estate planning that are important to you that you want to share with your kids, with your family, with your spouse, with the world at large? So we'll talk about how to incorporate legacy into your planning. Okay, so back to number one, planning for your kids. For those of you who are here and who have minor children, most likely the number one thing that keeps you up at night when you think about a legal plan for your family is what happens to my kids if something happens to me or to us if you're married? Who takes care of them? What happens? How does it all work? Uh, and the number one thing that you need to know is that if there is no plan, a stranger is going to make all of these decisions for your kids, who takes care of them, ultimately where they live. And this stranger doesn't know anything about you. This stranger doesn't know your kids, doesn't know who you would choose to take care of your kids, doesn't know if there's anyone you would never choose under any circumstances. And this stranger who's making all of these decisions for your kids is a probate court judge. So that's the number one thing I want you to know. No plan, a stranger, a probate court judge is making these decisions for your family. The second thing I want you to know is that there's two different time frames you should be thinking about and planning for around your kids. Most parents only think about one of these time frames, and most estate planning attorneys only help you to think about one of these time frames. And it's not because they're bad people or it's just simply because most traditional estate planning attorneys are primarily focused on clients in their 60s and 70s and 80s whose kids are already grown. So they're not thinking about guardianship consistently on a day-to-day -day basis, day in and day out. But as I said, I had to figure all of this out for my own family, for my own kids when they were young. And I recognized that there was a second time frame that I had to plan for. And I, did, and I wanna start there because most parents never think about this. And so there's a long-term time frame. If you're to die, who do you want to step in and care for and love and, and raise your kids? The second time frame is what we refer to as a short-term time frame. And that's just basically the time between some, when something happens to you and when your long-term guardian can arrive to take over the care of your kids. And for a lot of people, there is a time gap there. And for me, there was a time gap there. And the time gap looked something like this. When my wife and I, uh, when our kids were still young, my wife and I had a standing date night. Every other Thursday night, our teenage babysitter came over and Paul and I went out somewhere. Didn't matter where, we, it was just the kids were young. It was just a way to get out of the house. And one night coming home from our date night, we were having a conversation in the car and we realized that our babysitter, who I think was either 16 or 17 year old, years old at the time, uh, you know, if we were talking about what happens if we get in a car accident on the way home and a police officer shows up on our doorstep. And we realized that our babysitter, who was a teenager, lovely kid, mom was the school nurse in town, uh, but our babysitter did not know who our long-term guardians were. We had long-term guardians, my sister, my brother-in-law, but they lived two and a half hours away in Connecticut. And what we realized that if there was an emergency and a police officer showed up on our doorstep, our babysitter wouldn't know what to do, wouldn't know who to call. The kids weren't old enough at that point to be able to say, hey, Aunt Kate and Uncle Bill, they're in Connecticut, give them a call. And even if the kids could say that and a call could be made, it would have taken my sister, my brother-in-law two and a half hours to drive up from Connecticut. And I realized in that moment 
that that time gap meant most likely, if not certainly, that in an emergency, the police would call in uh, the Department of Children and Families, which is the agency in Massachusetts that gets a call when something happens to parents and there's no clear plan. And I realized that a caseworker from DCF would show up at my house and my kids would be removed from our home and placed in the hands of strangers until everything could be sorted out. And my wife and I decided in that car ride home that we could not and would not allow that to ever happen. And then I had to figure out how to prevent that from happening. And here's the good news. I did it. And I built that part of the plan into my estate plan. And as I said before, now we build into the plans of all of our clients, and I'm going to share it with you. And what I discovered is that you can name what we call short-term guardians or first responders. Think about all of the people who live close to where you live your friends, your neighbors, maybe some family members. Think about people who are within a 15 or 20 minute travel radius around your house. And you can give those people short-term legal authority to come over and be with your kids on a short-term basis until your long-term guardians can arrive and take over wherever it is that they're coming from. Your guardians might be an hour away or a couple of hours away, or they may be a flight away. I have clients whose families would take at least days to get here and potentially weeks to get here, especially with everything that's going on in the world right now. Um, and so with short-term guardians legally named, you've got people right around your house who can step right in and take care of your kids until those long-term guardians can arrive and take over, however long that takes. And so that's what I discovered. That's what the first thing I wanted to share with you so you could start to think about guardianship and taking care of your kids and protecting your kids in a different, deeper way than you've probably thought about before. And we'll talk more about how to, what's, in, what's part of that kind of planning and how to get that in place. So that's short-term guardians for your kids. The other side obviously is long-term guardians. The people you know and trust to step in and raise your kids as close to the way that you would if you were still there. And again, as I mentioned earlier, if you don't make this decision, a judge makes this decision for you. And they obviously, a stranger cannot make as good a decision for your kids as you can. You are in the best position to know that. So it requires creating a plan. You have to create a plan for what happens if you die. You have to create a plan for what happens if you're incapacitated. Now the people are probably gonna be the same, but you just have to be aware that there's different circumstances that you need to be planning for and not all estate planning attorneys, again, are digging deep on these issues that are paramount for parents with young kids. You've gotta be thinking about who you want to name. If they're married, what happens if something happens to one of those people? Do you want, you know, if your sister and your brother-in-law are your long-term guardians, do you want your brother-in-law to serve alone? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe your brother-in-law is better than your sister, you know, and again, they're different for everybody. And you want to be thinking about whether or not there are people in your immediate family that you don't want to be the guardians, that you are afraid may challenge your decisions, because there is a way to exclude people that you know you don't want from being the guardians of your kids. So those are all the things to be thinking about. Those are all the considerations. Those are the kinds of decisions that you need to make to create, again, a rock solid legal plan for your kids if you're not there to raise them. Last thing, once they're all 18, you know, all of my kids are over the age of 18, I got a 24 year old and a 20 year old, guardians are not part of my plan anymore. They were, and now they're not. But just know until your youngest child turns 18, this is part of your plan. And it's always the starting point for, for parents with young kids, for fit, young families, because that's the most important consideration. So I wanted to start there. So that's number one, plan for your kids. All right, now let's move on to number two, planning for your money and for your assets. And this applies to everybody uh, on the call, no matter whether you've got young kids or older kids, even if you don't have any kids, you still have to create a plan for your money or for your assets, because again, if there's no formal plan in place, a default plan kicks in. And for most people, the default plan is a disaster. So let's not leave your families with a disaster. The first thing to know 
is that if you own your assets in your own name or names, if you're married, whether you own them individually or jointly, if those assets are in your names, if you die, those assets are going to have to go through a court process known as probate. If you're married and you own everything jointly, this is the process that's going to kick in really when something happens to the survivor of you. But when we're planning for a married couple, we're always looking at what happens if something happens to both of you. Assets in your own name go through this court process. Now, the reason they have to go through a court process is because the court has to determine, number one, what did you own at the time of your death? They have to determine what is the value of what you owned at the time of your death. They have to figure out whether any creditors have claims against those assets. And then the court's job is to, to determine who is entitled to receive those assets after creditor claims, who among your family members, or what we call your heirs at law, and the court supervises the distribution of, of your assets to those people. Now, if you have a will, your will gets filed with a probate court, and the will follows the instruction, uh, the court follows the instructions in your will as to where those assets go. If you don't have a will, everything happens by a default plan in which you have no input and no control. So again, that's why it's so important to plan. It's the only way that you have control over what happens to all of your assets, all of your resources. Let's talk about that probate process for a second. So first of all, the court appoints someone known as a personal representative. And that person's job is to identify your assets, to get appraised values for those assets. The, your personal representative reports everything to the court. All your assets get listed on schedules. The schedules get filed with the court. Again, the court will give your creditors a period of time to make claims against those assets. And then ultimately everything gets distributed to your heirs at law. That court process has drawbacks. The first of which is it takes a long time in Massachusetts. It's at least a year in probate in Massachusetts, often longer, never shorter. The reason why it's never shorter is because that year, that's the creditor claims period that the Commonwealth gives to your creditors. They get a full year to make claims against your assets. And so your assets can't be distributed until that claims period has expired. So your family is going to be dealing with the court for at least a full year and potentially longer, sometimes much longer, depending upon the complexity of the estate. So it's long. It's expensive. There are lots of expenses in a probate court process. There's filing fees, publishing fees, accounting and appraisal fees, legal fees, executor, trustee, bonding fees. If your kids are still young, someone's got to manage those resources for them, and that person is receiving a fee for managing those resources. So for most people, you're talking about tens of thousands of dollars that are getting chewed up in this probate court process. So long, expensive, it's cumbersome for your families. And by that, I mean your families won't have immediate access to those assets. If they need access for any reason, food, clothing, shelter, education, healthcare, they would need to get permission from the probate court first. And that can take weeks or months, depending upon where in the process things stand. Now, if your kids are adults, that may not be the biggest deal in the world. But if your kids are young, that can be a really, really big deal. And very often, your family members would have to dig into their own pockets to pay for expenses. Um, and most people don't like the, that that's going to happen. So long, expensive, cumbersome. Again, if your kids are minors under the age of 18, the court is going to appoint someone to manage resources for them. Now, that person is, again, going to be another stranger. This is someone that the court is simply going to appoint. It's most likely not going to be any of your family members. Someone they know who has experience managing money. And again, someone is going to get paid for doing that. And by the way, if you have more than one child, the court very often will appoint more than one person, a different person for each child. So your guardians may be dealing with multiple people who are managing the money because uh, the court will might decide that the economic interests of your kids are not exactly aligned. If you don't have any plan and you have minor children, your kids are going to receive your assets when they turn 18. Uh, and that's whether or not you think 18 is an appropriate age. It's whether or not they would be able to make wise decisions about what to do with these resources. Uh, by default, when your kids turn 18, they're entitled to receive that money Again, if there is no plan, that is part of the default plan. 
And then the last thing about probate that's concerning to people is that it's a very public process. Everything that gets filed with the probate court is a public document. If you've any, ever seen any celebrity will, the reason you can read any celebrity's will who's died is because they're all public documents. And if you go and Google celebrity wills, don't do it now, but maybe later, go Google celebrity wills and see what you come up with. It's fascinating. And the reason is everybody's probate filings, including their wills, if you have one, are public documents. So anybody can wander into the probate court in Middlesex County, that would be Monday through Friday, 8.30 in the morning to four in the afternoon, and pull out your probate documents and sit down and read through everything and make copies of everything and walk out the door with those copies. And for better or for worse, there are people who spend time in probate court looking to see when an 18 year old is about to inherit a substantial amount of assets. So that's probate as a process. Now, when I'm sitting with a prospective client, the number one question almost happens almost all of the time. When I say, do you have any questions about probate? And if I asked all of you, we're all sitting in a room together and I said, do you have any questions about probate? Most likely the first thing that will pop to your mind is, is there any way to avoid probate? Gets asked almost every single time. Here's the good news. The answer is yes, there is a way to avoid probate. It's pretty simple and straightforward, but most people don't incorporate it as part of their plans because they're not aware that this is something that could apply to them as well. And the way that you keep your family out of probate around your assets is to create, while you're still living, what we call a revocable living trust, and then transfer or retitle your existing assets in the name of the trust. Create a trust, you transfer your assets into the trust. Now, while you're still living, the trust is yours and all the assets in the trust are yours. If you're single, it's yours. If you're married, it belongs to both of you. You manage everything, you control everything, and it's all for your benefit. So it's like you're owning everything individually still. No separate tax filing, no separate tax ID. Your taxes look exactly the same. You have, there's no limitations to, to how you use your assets. You use them the same way you do right now. The difference is if you die, those assets don't have to go through probate. Trust assets don't go through a probate court process. Because when you die, instead of a court determining what happens to all of this, you've already built instructions into that trust and a successor trustee will step into your shoes as trustee to take over the management of those assets. If you've got young kids, they'll manage those assets and distribute those assets for the benefit of your kids. Education, healthcare, food, clothing, shelter, camps, dance lessons, all of it. And then when your kids are old enough, they'll be able to access that money uh, more directly. So the trust helps you to avoid that probate process completely. The other thing a trust can do is it can help you to save on estate taxes. Now, here's the thing. In Massachusetts, there is a state level estate tax in addition to the federal estate tax. Now, the federal estate tax doesn't apply to most people. If you are a US citizen right now, you have an $11.7 million federal estate tax exemption, which means unless you have more than $11.7 million when you die, you don't have to pay the federal estate tax. Good news, bad news. If you live in Massachusetts, there's a separate state level estate tax and it kicks in at just a million dollars. Now, a lot of people will think to themselves, I don't have a million dollars, but you'd be surprised. Add up the equity value in your house, which by the way is going up kind of exponentially all the time, given the market, the equity value in your house, the value of your bank accounts, the value of your taxable investment accounts, the value of all of your retirement accounts, and then the value, face value of your life insurance policies. So your life insurance policies counts towards that total, which comes as a surprise to a lot of people. And for a lot of people, that's what pushes them over that million dollar threshold. Now, in Massachusetts, if you have more than a million, you know, at just a million dollars, the tax would be almost $39,000. If you had a million and a half dollars when you died, the tax could be $70,000. If you have $2 million, it's $106,000 and it just keeps going up from there. Now, if you're married, you can shelter up to $2 million from tax. 
So if you have $2 million on the death of the survivor of you, instead of paying $106,000 to the Department of Revenue, if you've got no plan, your family could pay zero, which means there's an extra $106,000 for the people you care about the most, instead of it all going to the Department of Revenue. So a trust can save, uh, can, can keep your family out of that probate court process. A trust can save you on estate taxes. Here's the third benefit of a trust. It can protect your adult children from things going sideways in their adult lives. Now, if you've got young kids, this is important for you to listen to too, because someday your kids will be adults. Now, as I've watched my kids progress from preschool, daycare age, through grade school, through junior high, through high school, my oldest daughter is out of college, living and working on her own. My youngest daughter is halfway through college. What my wife and I have discovered along the way is that things have changed for them. Now, we always imagine when they were really young that, is, that they would be, somehow we imagine that when they were 20, 21, 22, they would be wildly self, you know, independent, money savvy, good decision makers, but we know that that doesn't always happen. Now, I've got great kids. They're really pretty good about money and decision-making. But I mean, I remember what I was like when I was 21, 22. It wasn't always pretty. And we know executive decision-making function doesn't fully develop in, you know, until you're 25. So what I've discovered is that a lot of people want to make sure that no matter what happens in their kids' lives when they're adults, that that money can be protected, that whatever they're leaving to their kids is only available to the kids and not to anyone else, not to a creditor, not to somebody who might sue their child if the kid is involved in a lawsuit, and certainly not if their children marry and later get divorced, certainly not uh, that that money go walking out the door with a future divorcing spouse. So what a trust allows you to do is to set things up in such a way so that the money that is you're leaving behind for your kids can't be taken away from them by third parties in their adult lives. So if things go wrong, things go sideways, they can still use the money, but no one else can take it away from them. And that's a really big thing. As my kids have grown older, that has become an important part of our plan. And I can see that in the clients that I, that I work with. So again, the trust keeps your family out of probate, saves your family on estate taxes and can protect your adult children uh, and the resources that you leave to and for their benefit from being taken away from them by other third parties in their adult lives. A revocable living trust is the cornerstone of a really, really good rock solid plan for your money and for your assets. And by the way, when we're working with clients in our office, about 95% of the work that we do is trust-based planning. And it's not because we are, you know, hitting hard on you should have a trust, you should have a trust, you should have a trust. It's simply because when we lay everything out on the table, most people will opt into a trust-based plan because they want things to be as easy as possible uh, for their families. Okay, now let's go to number three, uh, planning for your incapacity. Um, and I think this is particularly important right now. If you are sick in the hospital and unconscious and you need someone to step in and make decisions for you, whether they're healthcare or legal or financial, the very first thing you need to know is that your family doesn't automatically get to step in and do these things for you. Your spouse doesn't automatically get to step in and do these things for you. And so to make sure things are as easy as possible and things can happen as quickly as possible if necessary, that you have an incapacity plan in place. And by the way, if you have adult children, your adult children need this plan. If you've got an 18 year old going off to college in the fall, they need this plan too, because you probably recognized as soon as they turned 18, certain people who used to talk to you freely no longer talk to you without your child's permission. People like their healthcare provider, even their guidance counselor in high school will stop talking to you halfway through senior year if they turn 18, unless your child has given them permission to communicate with you. So every adult 18 years of age or older needs a plan for incapacity. What should be covered in this plan? Number one, healthcare. In Massachusetts, there are three documents that created to cover healthcare. The first is called a healthcare proxy. That is the legal document in which you appoint someone else 
to step in and make healthcare decisions for you if you can't make those decisions for yourself. The second document is called a HIPAA waiver or a HIPAA authorization. And it allows your decision makers that you've appointed to also get full access to all of your medical information that might otherwise be prevented from disclosure under HIPAA, the federal medical privacy law. So we wanna make sure that everybody can access the documents that they need, that they can speak freely with healthcare providers so that they can make informed and intelligent decisions on your behalf. And then the third document is called a living will. And it's simply a roadmap that you create uh, for your healthcare decision makers about how you want them to make decisions around life-sustaining treatment. Uh, do you want to be kept alive artificially? Do you not want to be kept alive artificially? And under what circumstances? So that is a document, again, that serves as guidance to your decision makers about how you want them to make those healthcare decisions for you. So that's the healthcare side of things. On the other side, we've got legal and financial decision making, and that's done through a single combined document known as a durable power of attorney. Same idea as a healthcare proxy. If you're incapacitated, if you can't make decisions for yourself, this document appoints someone else to legally step in and manage your financial affairs, to make decisions for you, to make legal decisions, to sign legal documents, to reallocate the investment mix in a 401k, to access your bank accounts, to even do things as simple as going to the post office and picking up your certified mail, or to manage your social media accounts. Basically to do all of the kinds of things that you're used to doing for yourself uh, or selves on a day-to-day -day basis. But if you're incapacitated, you wouldn't be able to do those things. So a power of attorney is important as well. And again, for every adult, 18 years of age or older, one of the things that we're working really hard on right now in the office is what we call our 18 plus plan for young adults. Everybody who's turned 18, who's going off to college in the fall, right now we are working through a series of signing meetings with those young adults to help them get a healthcare proxy, a HIPAA waiver, a living will, and a power of attorney in place so that if they go off to school and they get sick or if they get injured, mom or dad or both can step in and make decisions for them and get information about them in a way that they might be prevented from without that plan in place. Okay, so that's plan for incapacity. One more thing to talk about, and then I'm gonna kind of start to show you how you can get this all in place. And that's plan for legacy. And I said at the outset that this is a kind of a different concept. It's a unique concept. Most estate planning attorneys aren't helping you to think about this, and they're not helping you to capture this. So what is planning for your legacy? Think of it this way. All of us, you, me, everyone, we're all walking around with assets that we want to share with our kids, with our family, and maybe we even just with the, with the world at large. We all have these gifts that are inside of us that we want to get out of us and share with other people. It's things like who you are, what's important to you, your values, your stories, your memories, your guidance, your advice. I mean, if you're a parent of a young kid, these are all the things that you wanna share with your kids in case you're not there to share it directly with them. It's all of the things you want your guardians to know about raising your kids if you are not there to do that. It's all the things you would want the trustees, the people who are managing money for the benefit of your kids to know about how you want those resources used while they're still young and how you want a trustee to teach your kids about how to use money wisely as they become older. So those are all things that live inside of us and they're intangible. And as a result, they don't get included in a traditional estate plan. You can't boil it down to words on paper or legal documents. So what, and, and I've discovered that we're all walking around with these assets and we wanna share with them. So we built into our planning in the office a way to help all of our clients capture these assets to get them down while they're still living, to record them so that they can be shared easily with others in the event you're no longer here. And we do it uh, uh, through what we call our family wealth legacy interview. It's part of every planning level in our office. After documents are signed, clients come back in for a final meeting. We sit down, we interview uh, the client. So if you were a client, I, you know, when you were working with me at the very end, I would sit down and interview you 
we record it digitally, and then you have an audio rec recording that you can leave behind for your kids and for your family. And I want you to think about it like this. Think about somebody, and you can do this right now. Think about somebody who's no longer in your life right now that you wish you could hear their voice again. Because for almost all of us, there's somebody who's no longer here who we wish we could hear their voice again so that we could hear their wisdom, so that just so we could hear their stories, um, just so we could hear them. And that's what the legacy interview is all about. I, from my grandmothers, I obviously have two grandmothers, my maternal grandmother and my paternal grandmother. From my maternal grandmother, my mother's mother, I only have a writing about the family story and the family history, no recording. So I can't listen to it. I can read the writing and I do on a fairly regular basis. And when I read it, I can hear it in my grandmother's voice. I can still hear her voice. It's as clear as to me today as it was uh, when I was a kid and right up until the time she died. But my kids can't hear that story in my grandmother's voice. They can read the story, but they can't hear the tone, the inflection that really gives that story richness and, and really gives it life. On the other hand, I have a recording from my other grandmother uh, that my stepmother and my father did with my grandmother. I think not, I never knew it existed. Uh, I think it was done not long before my grandmother died and she lived into her nineties. Um, and after my father died and my stepmother was cleaning out uh, parts of their condo, I think she came across a recording, it's on a CD and she sent it to me, I think, because she thought I'd be interested in it because of what I do. And that CD has been kicking around. Um, it's, it was in my car, because that's the only place I have a CD player left uh, in my older car. And when I gave my older car to my daughter, the CD kind of stayed in there. And the other day, my daughter came home and said, hey, we are listening to your grandmother, uh, your grandmother Feeks, uh, while we are driving around today. And I've listened to that recording many, many, many times. And it was fascinating to me because it allowed me to hear things about my grandmother that I never knew before. I mean, I knew my grandmother was my grandmother. I didn't know her as a young woman. I didn't know her growing up. I didn't know the story of her family growing up. I didn't know the story of her as a young woman. I didn't know the story of her meeting my grandfather and how my grandfather courted her. I mean, this was back in the days when people courted each other. Uh, I didn't know she used to play the ukulele. I didn't know she sang in the women's choir. Um, but these were all things I learned and I didn't just learn them. I learned them through her. I learned them listening to her tell the stories. Uh, shaky at times, because she was in her nineties, but still the stories were very, very clear. It was fascinating. And so we have built that, as I said, into all of our planning levels. And I think that's a really import, important part of planning that most people miss. And when I do this work with clients, it's very humbling to be able to do this work with clients. Um, to watch the expressions on clients' faces when it's done, of relief, of joy, of pride, that they have created something that their kids, that their families can listen to if they're no longer there. That's, I think that's a really, really important piece. So I didn't want to miss sharing that with all of you. Okay, so those are the four elements of a rock solid legal plan, planning for your kids if they're minors, planning for your money or your assets for everyone, planning for incapacity for everyone 18 years of age or older, and finally planning for your legacy. Now, it's great to know all these things. Uh, I have a coach who quotes Bruce, Bruce Lee. And what Bruce Lee once said was to know and not to do is not to know. It's not enough to know this. You have to do. You have to do something about this. You have to make a decision. Uh, am I going to leave the way things are for my family right now or not? If you've been listening and you decide, hey, I've got the perfect plan in place right now. Thank you, David, for clarifying for me that I have the perfect plan in place right now. Great. I'm really happy for you. If you've been listening and you're thinking to yourself, I don't have a good plan in place. The default plan doesn't work for me. It won't be good for my family. It'll be a disaster for my kids. Then you will probably decide you need to do something else, but you've got to make a decision. Are you going to leave things the way they are right now for your family? If the answer is no, 
You can't just walk away from this and say, well, I made a decision because nothing will happen and circumstances won't change. And everything that we talked about will still happen to your family. And if you think that's a disaster, it'll still be a disaster. So if you decide, no, I don't wanna leave things the way they are. Now we've got to give you next steps to get this taken care of, okay? So, and what I recognize is a lot of people intellectually know what to do, but don't know where to turn to next or what the first step is or what that plan even should really look like. So let's just, you wanna have long-term and short-term guardians in place for your kids. You want to have that plan for your assets. If you don't wanna go through probate, that plan needs to include a trust, a revocable trust for you. Uh, you wanna have that plan for incapacity and you should have that plan for legacy. Now, one of the ways that you can get, well, you can get this done a number of ways. So let's just kind of go through them. Number one, you can do it yourself. And I recognize there's a lot of do-it-yourself tools out there, uh, LegalZoom, Quicken Willmaker, Susie Gorman has a book on trust. Here's what I know, um, and I always kind of explain it this way. Uh, if there's electrical work to be done in my house, I hire an electrician. Could I do the electrical work? I probably could. There's lots of YouTube videos uh, out there that I could watch. I could go to the library and pull books. I, I could train myself to be an electrician uh, and do all the electrical wiring in my house. But most likely if I go and watch a YouTube video and I attempt this, here's what's gonna happen. I'm either going to electrocute myself or I'm going to burn my house down. One of those two things is probably going to happen. Don't set your family's future on fire by trying to do this yourself if you don't have the capacity to do it. Here's what I know about LegalZoom. You're not gonna get a good plan. If you've got young kids, you're gonna get a, probably a disaster of a plan. You're probably almost better off with no plan at all. Um, so you could do it yourself, but it's not something I recommend. It's kind of like you should, probably shouldn't diagnose a shooting pain down your left arm. You should probably go to the emergency room and let an expert help you figure out what that's all about. If you're not doing it yourself, you've got to work with an attorney. If you're working with an attorney, here's what you want to keep in mind. Number one, you want to work with an attorney who matches where you are in life. If you are the parent of a young child or young children, you want to work with somebody who works with families with young kids day in, day out, all day, every day. You don't necessarily want to go to the attorney who helped your parents. If you're an empty nester, you want to work with somebody who's working with empty nesters all the time because you've got young adults. There's certain, there's different things that need to show up in your plan to help protect them. So you, that's number one. You want to work with somebody who's flat fee because you don't want to be paying by the hour for this. You want to work with somebody who's going to check in with you on a regular basis to help you know that your plan remains current and up to date and working the way you want it to. And you just want to make sure that you've got all, and you know, if you're doing legacy, as I said, most traditional estate planning attorneys don't do that. So if these are all the important things, that's what you want to be looking for. Um, I want to give you some resources here. Number one, I want to give you a pathway to get this plan in place. <clears throat> so I want to offer that first. The pathway is to take two hours of time in our calendar in the office with one of the attorneys in our office. Now, I am one of them. Uh, we have two other attorneys. Uh, Emily is an attorney in our office and James. Uh, they both, I have adult children. They have younger children. Um, so everybody has different ideas about who they want to meet with, but it's not just me. There's two other attorneys in the office. You can take two hours of time from any of us and the way to do that, and, and by the way, here's what we would do with that two hours of time. Number one, we would spend the first half of it helping you to get really, really clear about what's gonna happen to your kids, to your family, to your assets, if something happens to you right now, and then helping you to get, and that's under existing plan, and then to help you get really, really clear about where you wanna be instead. And if where you are is not where you wanna be, then our job is to help you understand how to get from point A to point B. So that's the first hour. And then you get to a decision point. Do I need to get my plan in place? 
Is David or his team the right fit for me? And if so, we've our, we've, we'll use the second half of our time together to start designing a new plan for you. So at the end of that two hour meeting, you could have already made all the decisions, decided on who's gonna play a role in your plan, walk away from that meeting knowing you're running forward and our job then is to pull everything together for a signing meeting. If you would like to get that two hours on our calendar, here's the first step. The first step is to schedule a call with our client services coordinator. Her name is Lori. You'll love talking with her. And Paula is gonna drop into the chat a link that you can click on to schedule an appointment with Lori. 10 or 15 minute call, Lori will get to know a little bit about you, a little bit about your family. We'll talk to you more about our process, what you can expect. How, Lori can get you booked for that two hour meeting if that makes sense. There's no obligation in talking to Lori at all. If it turns out we're not a good fit, at least you'll walk away from that call with a better understanding. If it turns out you are a good fit, Lori will help you uh, to get that scheduled with one of the attorneys in our office. So Paula, just drop that link into the chat. If you wanna book a call with Lori, it'll be there until the end of the webinar and you can just click on that link, open up a separate uh, window or tab in, in your browser and you can go right in there and pick a convenient time to schedule a call with Lori. Uh, two, let's, at least two other resources I wanna drop in and hopefully Paula, you can drop in the third resource as well. Uh, our kids protection planning guide. If you've got minor children, we're gonna drop a link in for our kids protection planning guide. You can click on that link, you can download the guide and you can read at your leisure a little bit more about the things that we've talked about today. If you are an empty nester, you can uh, download our empty nester guide. Um, and so Laura, uh, Paula will drop that into the chat. And the last one is our uh, grad guide. Uh, this is for the 18 plus plan for young adults, 18 years of age or older. We call it our grad guide, um, which is particularly appropriate at this time of year. And hopefully Paula can drop that into the link if she can't for any reason, because I may have just dropped that on her by surprise. Um, you can email support at parentsestateplanning.com and just that'll go to Lori and you can just ask Lori to connect you up with the grad guide. Um, so kids protection planning guide, empty nester guide and grad guide. And each one of those will give you a little more information about the kind of planning. Uh, great, Paula's got that link. Uh, we'll give you a little more information about the kind of planning that we do for families in different stages of life, whether you're a young family or an older family. Um, so I wanna get all those guides. Again, if you wanna schedule the intake call with Lori, that kind of exploratory call to see if we're a good fit for each other and to schedule an appointment on our calendar if you are, uh, that link for uh, scheduling the call for Lori is there. And I really encourage you to do it because there's really no downside to doing it. You'll either walk away with a much better understanding of where you are and deciding that you've got a good plan in place, or you'll walk away knowing, hey, I don't, and uh, I need to get something, I need to get something in place. All right, so now I want to go back up through the chat and pull out the questions um, that have popped up. Thank you. So, I, and again, thank you for dropping a cue in front of it, because again, this makes this easy. Um, Mark asks, uh, for assets not in a trust, but that identify adult child beneficiaries, does that bypass probate? The answer is yes. You can bypass probate with life insurance policies and retirement accounts by naming beneficiaries. And if the beneficiaries are at least age 18, then everything will pass outside of probate. If you've got young children, that doesn't work because minor children can't receive those kinds of assets directly. And so they would still get pulled into a probate process. But if those beneficiaries are adults, then yes, that is a way to bypass the probate process. Um, and then the next question, if money is in a trust for our adult kids and there are, and there are times distributions, there are, I'm assuming the, there are timed distributions to them, how are those assets protected from their divorce or lawsuits? Or is it only the money still in the trust but not distributed that is protected? Um, let's. Uh, Let's talk about that first. 
any money that gets distributed directly to your kids, no protection. Because once it's distributed to your kids, it's their money. And if they subsequently have creditor issues, that money is unprotected. If they get sued, it's unprotected. If they get divorced, that money could be considered a marital asset subject to division in a divorce. So yes, it is the money that remains in the trust that stays protected. So one of the ways to protect that money is to set up a plan where the money stays in the trust um, throughout your kid's lifetime, even though you can let them be in charge of managing that money. Um, uh, and then alternatively, can the money be left in the trust for our kids, but only taken out if, as they need it, and as they decide in order to protect from divorce or lawsuits? Yes. So as I said, we would create what we call a lifetime asset protection trust. Um, and your kids get the income and they can use the principal if they need it for specific purposes. And there's a standard that gets applied to it. Um, and I won't go into the details of the standard, but basically it covers health, you know, healthcare, educational expenses, food, clothing, shelter, transportation, reasonable vacations, things like that. Um, so yes, that, that is the way you do it. But again, important, anything that gets distributed directly to your kids, all protection is off and it is at risk, just like all of their own assets would be at risk in their lives. All right. It looks like that was it for the questions. Thanks, Mark, for asking those questions. Those are great questions. Um, I'll hang out here for another minute or so just to see if anybody else has any other questions. Um, again, the link is up there to schedule a call with Lori, and I strongly encourage you to do it 15 minutes. What's the worst that could happen, right? Best thing that could happen is you could figure out a way now to take the next step on the pathway to getting this done for yourself and for your family. And those links for the Kids Protection Planning Guide are there as well. Um, not seeing any other questions. Um, so I'm gonna hop out. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. I appreciate your interest. I appreciate your questions and your input. And if we can help you, I would really look forward uh, to helping you in the future. If you have any questions, after today, you can send them to our team uh, by email at support at parentsestateplanning.com. Support at parentsestateplanning.com. Thank you all again for joining us. And I hope to have the opportunity to talk to you or have a team member of ours talk to you uh, very, very soon in the future. We'd love to talk to you. Take care, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.